So I guess we should get started now. I guess we should get started. Um, I'd like to welcome everybody to the continuation of the hearing um, concerning the fate of the uh, St. John Cantius Church. I, um, actually, I don't have the parcel number in front of me at the moment. Carolyn, do I need that? Um, sure. It is, um, sorry, let's just put that up. It's 32A171, please. Okay. So for those of you who um, are here, who were here last time, and also for there are probably many of you who did not attend the initial hearing, what we're doing tonight is is a continuation of the original hearing about this. Um, the reason we continued it was we felt that we needed more information from the developers. Um, uh, so we're kind of going to pick up uh, where we left off a few weeks ago. Um, the uh, applicant is going to present us with new information concerning um, uh, this property, um, this property, and, um, and, and what we wanted to know. And um, after that happens, we in the committee will ask questions of the developer. And um, oh, Joe, no, we lost your audio. Yeah. Um, that's because I accidentally put him on mute. I'm sorry, Joe. I meant to put the other Blumenthal right. on mute because you I'm were, um, yeah, sorry right. about that. Okay, so um, well, I'm not sure how much you didn't hear. So it's a continuation of the hearing. We're picking up where we left off because we felt we needed more information from the developers. Um, the first thing that's going to happen is that I'm going to ask um, O'Connell to present um, uh, new information. And after that, um, uh, those of us on the committee are going to um, uh, ask questions of the, um, uh, of the developers. And um, after that, then we will open up the meeting for um, public comment. Um, the, uh, um, I think Bob needs to tell us a little something because he wasn't here for the last one, but... Um, Bob, do you want to? Yeah, I uh, want to apologize for the last meeting. Uh, I was present on the 23rd, not the 22nd. I'm sorry I missed that, but I reviewed the complete Zoom video of that meeting and I'm up to speed on uh, what has gone on to date. Okay, thank you. So, but, but you have seen the. Um, yeah, I, what I watched the whole meeting. Okay, good. So um, I guess now we are um, I'm going to ask somebody um, from the O'Connell company to, to present us with their new information. Yes, thank you. Um, thank you, committee, Carolyn as well. Um, if I can, I'll attempt to share my screen, which includes the updated presentation. Um, if there's any issue with viewing or sound, please let me know um, and I can try to retrace. Um, so as you mentioned, um, this presentation was prepared in response to a number of the questions and comments that came out of the, the February 22nd meeting. And um, this slide here just presents a quick roadmap of the, pro of the, the topics I'll look to cover tonight. Um, of those will include the structural and functional obsolescence of the church. We'll be joined again by Charles Roberts, uh, partner at Kuhn Riddle Architects, as well as about halfway through, we'll be joined by uh, Pat Goggins to give uh, a general kind of state of the, uh, the market in Northampton. Um, and after he's uh, submitted his, his testimony, we'll pick up from there and then be able to walk through some of the, uh, the design of the new replacement buildings, um, and we'll try to be limit any of the uh, the repetition from from the presentation uh, in February as much as possible. Um, and I think also it's worth noting that we'll also address uh, or at least try to counter some of the I think some of the comments and questions concerning the eligibility or the applicability of certain public uh, funding sources, uh, particularly 
the historic tax credit and um, low income housing tax credit in this context, as well as uh, some of the examples that were provided for a, uh, a local developer where um, through our research and feasibility studies have determined that um, probably would not apply to our site. Um, so with that, I will um, continue forward. Um, this uh, plan represents the existing site. It's uh, fairly straightforward, but uh, the site uh, was successfully subdivided as part of a approved a &R plan back in August, 2020. Um, as you can note, uh, the site is, is fairly constrained. It's just a little over a third of an acre. To give some context to our phase one uh, townhome project that's currently under construction, that's approximately 1.45 acres. Um, and when I discuss the low income housing tax credit and some of the, the density requirements that those funding uh, sources uh, require, um, it'll really bring to focus the, the site constraints that um, the former church, um, you know, what were dealt with in terms of site constraints. In terms of uh, existing conditions, the next three slides provide the, the general space layout as well as the um, really the existing conditions. Um, this is the, the basement uh, floor plan. Uh, so uh, plan left here is the basement and um, the balance of the site um, or the property is the, the crawl space. Um, it's you know probably not as uh, in focus um, for this slide, uh, but it will become a little more important when I sh show the next slide in terms of the eligibility of the his historic tax credits. Um, I will say that one of the, the kind of central themes um, that will come um, across over the presentation is the square footage highlighted in yellow here, the first floor, which is approximately 6,400 acres or uh, square feet. Um, the rest of the square footage um, is really either unmarketable or unusable and, and frankly, probably inaccessible. Um, for example, um, bell tower floor has, has essentially zero value in the market. Um, like I mentioned uh, earlier, this is the, the first floor, the ground floor plan left. You see the sacristy, um, a small storage area, and then essentially just a full open sanctuary. Um, and one of the, uh, the questions that came up is the eligibility of the historic tax credit um, funding source. And uh, based on our cultural resource consultant, the sanctuary, this um, completely open space is the character defining piece of the church. And therefore, if there was gonna be anything that would add partitions, demising walls or columns would be um, essentially uh, render ineligible for historic tax credit funding. Um, as you can imagine, when this was developed, it was developed with the intent of being a church forever. Um, so uh, they, they valued the openness and uh, there's other than um, a small vestibule area and storage and the, the sacristy, there's really no demising walls, uh, partitions or columns. Um, one thing that to also mention um, in terms of uh, how the, the, the property was delivered the diocese did fully deconsecrate the, the church and in doing so removed all really architecturally and religious ornamentation. And that did include um, the stained glass windows and the exterior here and here. Um, this is more just for uh, illustrative value, um, this cross section here is a good example of the, the design style that um, many Polish Catholic church uh, designs were uh, modeled after in that era. Uh, the peak ceiling height is approximately 31, uh, 39 feet. Um, and one of the limiting factors of this uh, barrel vault design is that uh, in particular with commercial and office reuse, um, you're really limited to two feet because of the, the height constraints that become very obvious once you try to go over two stories. Um, so in this section here, just wanted to provide a, uh, a citation to the relevant code provision. 
um, as well as the provision and uh, the demolition criteria that's under the design guidelines. Um, and this is really um, in including the highlighted section is the, the standard by which um, we viewed our options. It's the, the reasonableness standard. Um, and unfortunately, based on our feasibility studies and our market outreach and um, essentially all of our alternative analysis, we were not able to um, find an option that uh, was not outweighed by the, the structural or the functional obsolescence of the church. Um, so these photographs kind of speak for themselves, but they were um, commissioned as part of an overall uh, structural and building assessment by Ty and Bond. Um, and these photos are not isolated to any one area. It's representative of the, the entire building. So rather than um, show numerous photos of essentially the same condition, these represent um, the building. Um, so kind of working clockwise, you can see here the wood trim rotting on the roof of the south wall. You can see the moisture staining on the interior plaster wall on the south wall of the church. Um, quite a bit of moisture staining and interior plaster is both failing and falling. Um, same condition here on the north side of the chapel. You can see uh, the condition of the, the paint and plaster that's falling above the north side of the chapel here. And again, um, above the basement stairs have considerable um, moisture infiltration and uh, which has caused paint peeling and plaster to fail and fall. In this picture here, uh, do have plaster cracking in the ceiling at the column in the sacristy. And then also um, evidence of uh, water moisture infiltration on the staining of the interior brick on the south side with, with also uh, significant cracking. Um, and not to belabor the point, but we do have uh, the damaged downspouts with staining and vines. You can see here and here, as well as evidence of exterior uh, uh, a brick moisture infiltration. There's also a call out here, which uh, shows uh, both the asbestos containing insulation piping um, throughout essentially all the crawl space and the basement area. Um, we did receive uh, bids to fully abate uh, those issues, including the mold, and that's approximately $85,000. You can see here also uh, plaster that's falling in the corner of the basement, and then also uh, significant uh, water infiltration in the basement floor, which is dirt. Again, um, this is an example of the asbestos lined piping we do have evidence of mold in the ceiling beams and uh, multiple columns. This here again is the, the, the asbestos lined um, boiler. Um, and then also here we have uh, evidence of the, the moisture infiltration along the brick columns and do have the asbestos uh, lined insulation on the piping. Um, this will also give kind of an indication of, of the, the level of capital improvements and maintenance that was undertaken uh, by the church prior to our purchase. Um, this was the sole maintenance record um, in the building. It's a little bit difficult to see, but the, the last maintenance record was in December 2015, and there were no capital improvements made to the church uh, for the, the prior 10 years uh, before we closed on the property. These are somewhat more recent photos, but they will show the deteriorated condition of the window caulk and the window framework. I, I believe one of the comments from the last uh, uh, presentation was that the, the church appeared to be um, essentially bone dry and tight. Um, you can see, you know, except for um, essentially gravity, there's uh, fully exposed mortar joints along the brick line. Again, same condition here, window framing. This is the condition of the bell tower where we see significant exposed roof where the, the slate roof has either 
fallen off or has not been um, properly installed. Um, and that's caused uh, significant water infiltration to the bell tower and then also leads to this condition at the, at the gutters and mortar joints. These two photos uh, were, were part of our internal uh, building evaluation at the bell tower and you can see effervescence, water infiltration and exposed um, brick joints. This is inside of the bell tower um, and um, you can see the, the evidence of the water infiltration both on the, the underside of this, this decking here, but uh, throughout including um, those photos that I pr uh, provided earlier. So these tables and calculations uh, essentially um, convert those photos into financial terms and provide um, the cost implications for those issues. Um, so hopefully this is somewhat straightforward, uh, but the top half of this, uh, this page here is the, the cost to restore the building to weather tight condition and a minimally safe uh, condition. Again, back to the 6,400 square feet that I referenced earlier in the presentation. Um, and as you can see, in order to repoint and do full restoration cleaning of the entire building, replace the roof with architecturally consistent slate, scaffolding, and the replacement windows, we're at uh, over a million dollars. And how that um, is relates to the rental market. Um, so this is this is structured to create a break-even analysis, and that break-even point um, is based on a ten-year hold. And uh, for the first use, the commercial restaurant, we've assumed a three hundred fifty dollar tenant improvement um, allowance paid out. We add back this million dollars for the the weather tight condition amortize that over 10 years to get our break even. Again, this is without um, any profit um, to us. We are at a price per square foot rental rate of between 45 and $51. Uh, Pat will uh, speak to you know, some of the more um, specific and historic information concerning the rental market in Northampton. But if I can jump down very quickly um, to a CoStar report, um, apologies for, for toggling very quickly. Um, but the, the current market that we undertook to evaluate is this kind of main retail corridor. So this will give the boundary of, of the main um, retail areas in Northampton that we evaluated. Again, this is just a simple aerial with reference to where we're located. Um, in connection with, with the, mean, the, the main retail corridor. And the current market rental rate is $23 per square foot. So in order to break even um, between $45 and $51, we're, we're looking to uh, charge a rental rate, an asking rate of anywhere between two and 2.25 higher than anything in the market. Um, and I, I also did circle the vacancy rate um, for this reason, uh, that, that main corridor is currently at a 26.5% vacancy rate. Um, and I'm sure you, um, those in the public have seen the empty storefronts. But co according to CoStar in that market, um, while we're still bullish on Northampton, they're projecting close to a 35% vacancy rate by the end of 2023. So we also looked at the uh, potential reuse of the site into a for rent project that's represented uh, at the, the bottom here, assuming a $250 per square foot uh, fit out, adding back the, the cost to restore the building to weather tight conditions. So same form and, and structure as we looked at the, the retail reuse. Um, 
assume that again, a 10 year hold, we are looking at a, a rental, a monthly rental rate of between 3,800 and 4,400 to break even. Um, a similar third party market provider, uh, market data provider is Axiometrics. Um, keeping in mind that 3,800 to 4,400 a month to break even. The multifamily market in uh, Northampton, the average price per month is $1,500. And at the, the newest, um, and I believe this is part of Round Hill that came online in January of this year, is projecting or marketing at $2,000 a month. So we would be um, looking to support to break even a starting monthly rent of between two and a half to three times uh, what the market conditions can support in Northampton. So transitioning over to the, the second criteria in terms of um, obsolescence, uh, this is a quick summary, this was uh, discussed during the February 22, uh, 22nd meeting, uh, but in terms of the marketing history of the site, um, it's our understanding that the last service was on uh, January 3rd, 2010, and since, since that point has sat vacant, unused, and unheated, um, despite being um, actively and continuously marketed uh, prior to our purchase, there were no takers. Um, so you can imagine based on the maintenance records that were provided and the fact that there were no capital improvements made uh, from the last 10 years, there's, um, there's been clear signs of uh, deferred maintenance. Um, now at this point, we'd like to hand it over to Pat to give his update on the, the current Northampton real estate market. Is Pat here? Here I am. Pardon me. I guess I didn't have the mute. Yeah, thank you. So uh, good evening and thank you, Matt. I'm uh, Pat Goggins of Goggins Real Estate. And uh, I've been asked to comment uh, on some of the uh, questions that were raised at the last meeting relative to the uh, condition of downtown real estate. Uh, the description that I've used most often um, over the last several years is that we're in a state of transition. And um, that transition that we are um, presently and actually um, started to take place prior to the COVID in a way that was recognizable. And um, many of you may remember um, uh, some lengthy articles that the Gazette did uh, probing into the conditions downtown and the reasons for it. And uh, so we've been trying to address that in a way that uh, um, we all would like to see us get back to a condition that represented the, um, what we remember is the, the better times in, in the greater downtown area. But um, what has happened over that period of time is that I, I presently have twice as many uh, commercial uh, properties on the market for lease than uh, I've ever had before in 48 years of selling real estate. It's a number that's daunting. It's a number that's hard to accept. And it's a number that we're only starting to now inch our way at trying to make some progress in, in, uh, in filling. Um, the, I, as a practical matter, have uh, stopped putting uh, for lease signs in the uh, uh, in many of the properties I have for lease, so as to not make it look flooded. Uh, despite some of the recent successes we've had, and uh, I'm very happy to say that we have had some with Kathy Cross and Fellow and uh, Artisan Gallery. Uh, the uh, uh, 
we still have many uh, other locations, which many of you have seen for quite some time now and probably scratch your head about like cereals on State Street. And uh, that we've had, it's been very challenging for us to fill up with, uh, with new tenants. The result of this oversupply that I'm describing uh, of the properties uh, being, is that the properties are being rented for significantly lower than what they had been rented in the, in, uh, the past, the price per square foot. Um, that uh, the cost of, of uh, converting the uh, church to uh, you know commercial space that would result in in, in um, uh, rental prices that are typical in the market would still be uh, only half of what uh, as Matt explained uh, the real cost of uh, providing that space would be. So I mean that's a recipe for disaster and it's one that no one. Uh, uh, would uh, look at is something that they would pursue and, and it would uh, uh, the idea of uh, commercial success. Um, the, the, the area that it's really most noticeable that, and that we're all concerned about and many have talked to me about endlessly now for quite some time is, a, is the reputation that we had as a restaurant city and, and the fact that we've lost seven restaurants in the greater Northampton area in the last during the during the COVID period, that's very concerning. That's one that uh, that is a, a trend that we're not happy with. Uh, I talk with all of the restaurateurs uh, uh, all the time, and they'd like nothing better than to have a couple of new restaurants come to town. But we've had um, very little entrepreneur, entrepreneurial activity with respect to restaurants prior to COVID, and we've had really none since. So the downward trend in terms of uh, commercial space is, uh, is uh, disturbing. It's, uh, it's something that uh, does not uh, support speculative development. And uh, um, in my case, I've sh uh, I have shown the uh, church property many times over the 11 years that it's been on the market. I've shown it to people who've been interested in residential development. I've shown it to a book binder, binder from Connecticut. I've shown it to a uh, social uh, service agency among, among others. And, uh, and you know, all of them have uh, reached the conclusion that it, it became clear that uh, the uh, cost of converting that space was excessive and they all walked away. And as a practical matter, it's just too costly to reuse. Having said that, I'm cautiously optimistic about downtown, but I think as, a, as the co-star information that Matt provided suggests, you, you will see that it, we're probably um, a good couple of years away from uh, being able to get ourselves in, uh, straightened out in terms of the overall downtown impression. I try to talk about it uh, uh, in a very positive way as often as I can, because it's important to, uh, to try to let people know that there's, there's there's still hope, you know, cautiously optimistic, as I said, but um, it's if we're a year and a half to two years out, then that's something that can't be ignored. And I hope I'm wrong, but that is the way that it's looking. And that's why people are shying away from any kind of uh, significant um, commercial development in the greater downtown area. Thanks very much. Thanks, Pat. Um, and continuing from, from that information, I uh, can transition over to some of the, the feasibility studies and the progression of our research, both in terms of test fits and market outreach. Um, a few of those things high level. So we did have uh, continuous discussions, negotiations with the Boston-based uh, restaurant hospitality group that was interested in creating a, a multi-use venue, which had a, uh, a very extensive outdoor music and dining component. Um, but as soon as the uh, global pandemic uh, took root, they had uh, lingering and still have uh, concerns over the long-term consumer spending habits for Northampton and uh, Massachusetts as a whole. And so they, they withdrew. Um, and kind of bolstering that point um, in our experience, uh, both being active in the market and then also being third-party property managers for a number of uh, 
these type of uses, we found that uh, very few commercial and retail end users are expanding their physical presence or really have any immediate plans to do so. And I think um, going back to the CoStar report, which shows um, you know, an unfortunate trend of currently 23% vacancy to almost 35% in, in two years is kind of the sober reality that we've been, we've been working with. Um, but with that said, uh, do you wanna share some of the, the test fits and uh, concepts that we've explored? Uh, this was prepared by Kuhn Riddle back in August uh, 2019, and it contemplates approximately 180 seat uh, main dining room supported by another 85 feet of outdoor dining patio, which uh, this area here, just to give a little bit more reference, would be on Phillips Place, and here would be uh, Holly. From 2019, we also continued and engaged Austin Design, which is a prominent uh, brewery uh, design firm, which has done work for uh, Treehouse, uh, Lawson's, and then, as I understand it, uh, Northampton Brewing. This shows a seven barrel capacity uh, brew house uh, cafe, which would support uh, seasonal production. Um, it, it's a 150 to 160 patron dining room uh, with a uh, supporting bar area. This was advanced in, as you can see, in July of 2020, essentially in the, in the, in the middle of, of COVID. So despite a lot of our uh, kind of headwinds that were working against us, uh, we did uh, still pursue and continue exploring test fits with um, Austin Design and uh, still holding out hope that we could um, convert this into a viable reuse, um, but we were unsuccessful based on kind of the economic realities that um, came to the forefront. This provides uh, just a quick rendering of that concept, which shows the, uh, the brewing tanks, the bar area, seating area, and then the high top area. And just going clockwise shows just different viewpoints of that concept. Although this is a repeat, I uh, just wanted to provide uh, another um, chance to discuss the rent implications for all of these concepts um, on, the, on the commercial retail restaurant concept, we'll be looking at two to 2.5 times the current market rate. And similarly uh, on the multifamily, we'll be looking at somewhere in the neighborhood of about two and a half to three times the, the current market rate for um, multifamily. So continuing on the idea of uh, functional obsolescence, uh, there was a number of, I think, comments and uh, questions concerning uh, the viability of historic tax credits. We did engage uh, VHB on their cultural resource team who specifically um, and solely handles historic tax credits in Massachusetts. Um, and they walked through and provided uh, not only the, the number of churches that have been uh, filed with the National Park Service throughout the United States, but also in Massachusetts. And you can see here that uh, there was a recent report that since the 1990s, which was pretty much the, the implementation of the historic tax credit program on a federal level, 0.7% involved churches. And of those only 0.2 or 82 developments were successfully executed. So 82 out of 40,000 historic tax credits were successfully executed for a church. Um, of that, we wanted to drill down and see how many of those 82 were actually part of uh, the successful applications in Massachusetts. And as you can see here, since the 1990s, only five uh, Massachusetts projects have submitted a part two application the overall application process is three. And of those five, four received approvals and one was denied. So four out of 40,000 historic tax credits um, have been successfully implemented in Massachusetts. In terms of the, the timeline for that type of funding, 
Um, and this is uh, kind of notwithstanding the fact that the conclusion from our cultural resource uh, consultant was that we would not be eligible for um, tax credits if we were to pursue a multifamily or any um, any type of residential, well, for that matter, any, any project that um, added columns, demising walls, or um, partitions within the sanctuary, we would be ineligible. Um, but uh, notwithstanding that fact, uh, the timing would be at least two and a half years uh, from application to funding. One of the key points too, is that it, it is an all or nothing program. So uh, based on their conclusion, all of the, the proposed treatments, both exterior and interior, need to meet the standards or there are no credits. So it would not be in a situation where we could qualify on the exterior uh, improvements alone. Um, it would be holistic. Um, another one of the uh, topics that came out was the, the availability of um, low-income housing tax credits. I believe this was uh, more related to the replacement type property. Um, just to give a quick background, um, our, our portfolio does currently include over 1,200 units of income restricted housing all throughout Massachusetts. And we do own 112 in Northampton. Um, it's right before the appendix, but uh, as we progress through this report, we'll be able to, to show those projects. So we absolutely understand the importance of affordable housing and um, you know, we think we do our part in, in supporting it. Um, referencing back to the third of the acre, um, I did make mention of the fact that the tight um, acreage would be somewhat constraining in terms of trying to fit the, the density requirement of these funding sources. In our experience, we've, we've found that uh, between a minimum of 30 to 40 units is, is typically the sweet spot. And so if we were assuming a 5,100 square foot floor plate with four or five units per floor, which would include um, the necessary circulation, mechanicals, um, and exit points, we would, we would need to go to six stories. Um, and we don't feel that um, a six story um, apartment building is, is consistent with the built environment um, in the neighborhood. And um, don't feel it's appropriate in this location. That said, the, uh, the, the funding mechanism is very highly competitive and it would be a similar schedule two years from application to full application to awarding the tax credits. Um, this last point here, the housing development incentive program, there was uh, quite a few references, I believe, to both in some of the, the, the letters that were submitted in support as well as some of the commentary was that um, a local developer, David Carver, um, who I did have the opportunity to speak to um, as, a, as a, a consequence of those comments from the February 22nd meeting. Um, he has found um, alternative funding sources, um, notably the, the HDIP program. And it's, it's worth noting that um, Northampton is not part of the Gateway City. So a number of the, the public sources that he taps in order to make his projects pencil would be completely inapplicable to Northampton. So uh, in terms of converting uh, the church into a similar project to, to level the, the five townhomes that we're proposing with a similar sized, uh, you know, roughly square footage concept, uh, we did engage our general contractor to develop a a budget. Um, and as you can see here, this provides um, a detailed breakout by division of the cost to convert um, the church into five for sale units, approximately 2000 square feet apiece. It's taken the same form and substance and uh, essentially the same structure as the multifamily and retail reuse that I identified earlier. So this is all on a cost per unit break-even basis. If you take all the hard costs, add back the soft costs, and then add back uh, the necessary insurance, the land cost, and real estate commissions, we are at a break-even price of 
close mm -hmm. to 885,000. Um, I want to kind of put this back into context with the, the reasonableness standard that was um, part of the design guidelines criteria for demolition. Um, and essentially, what this would do is uh, create a situation where we neither have uh, market comps or any data supporting this sales price. So we would be um, essentially taking to market uh, fully unproven product and also um, something that we believe would be unsellable. As I mentioned, here are the three uh, low-income projects that we do have in Northampton, 36 Bedford Terrace, 74 State Street, and 71, and 71 State Street, totaling 112 units. And with this, we'll uh, pass it to, to Charles Roberts at Hewn Riddle to discuss the replacement properties. Charles, you're on mute. Oh, thanks, Carolyn. Well, let me, I'll reintroduce myself. I'm Charles Roberts from Kuhn Riddle Architects and uh, want to thank uh, uh, members of the public and the, the uh, CBAC and, and Carolyn for hosting us this evening. Um, I want to run through um, a, a sort of a, a more developed design. Um, the last time we met, um, I had a sketch concept that I developed with O'Connell that was that that was um, an attempt to sort of relay uh, a, a really just an, a, a, an architectural idea or, or sketch concept for the site. And we have uh, gone back and and developed a more sort of uh, complete design and and tried to create a presentation that, that would give everybody a, a better sense of, of what we're talking about in, in um, rel relative to the uh, uh, the design guidelines for the downtown as well as the um, uh, the context that we're looking at here so I showed this this map last time this is the red the red circle is where uh, the st. John Church resides right now right sort of the crux of the uh, the residential district and the uh, and the central business district and uh it's surrounded by uh all different types of architecture residential architecture historic residential architecture um examples of of the central business district uh buildings both um uh, uh novel uh, anomaly buildings as well as uh, theme buildings and some transitional residential buildings so there's a lot to draw on and a lot to think about here um, in terms of what is an appropriate sort of architectural response to the site. Um, next slide, Matt. Um, these are reminders of some of the buildings in the neighborhood, the uh, um, colonial and Victorian homes, um, single family homes, and some of the larger homes that have been converted into apartments, which I sort of think of as the, uh, as, as the transitional residential um, type, of, type of building in the neighborhood. Um, next slide, Matt. And then some of the, uh, I guess you would call them anomaly buildings, the art center across, across from Holly Street, um, the, uh, the post office and um, the, the, the building immediately next door, I think that's the antique shop and the view through to, um, to, uh, to uh, the, the, the St. John property. And then um, in the lower two images are the buildings directly across the street from the church right now. Um, uh, the, the, the building in the lower left is, I, I would think of that as a theme building. It's 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 masonry. It's got nice masonry detailing. It has a, a, a sort of a, a natural progression of windows from street level up to the upper level, um, double hungs, and um, there's a nice kind of rhythm and proportion. The building next door is is kind of an anomaly building. It has its, it has its own charm. It's masonry. It's 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 uh, it's it's just 
you know, it's another member of the neighborhood and something that we have to respond to and think about and, and be sensitive to. Um, next slide, Matt. Um, so this is our this is our site here, and um, it, it's uh, we're looking at uh, five creating five units in two buildings. The building on the left is a is a two unit building or a duplex. And the building on the right along Phillips Place is is a triplex. Um, the, uh, the central business district requires a five foot maximum setback. So these buildings are all set to within um, that the two feet of the uh, of the property line where that bay projects out, and then the doors are recessed back another couple feet from there. Um, so the the there's a, there's an entry along these buildings that that, it, that it addresses the edge of the sidewalk and um, and, and the street, and then the um, the the main entrance is is um, along um, an existing curb cut that it's behind the church right now that circles in um, behind behind the uh, behind the buildings and then accesses um, two covered garage spaces per unit. So the first floor is, is uh, essentially an entry hall foyer, um, a small guest room or office space, um, potential live work situations for these guys, and then um, and then the two car garage. Um, in back on the first floor. And then the, the second level is uh, living kitchen, dining, public spaces. And on the third floor would be with the um, bedrooms. Um, next slide, Matt. Um, just to, so what we, what, what we were thinking about architecturally here was sort of with developing the idea of, of the theme building um, as an architectural expression for, for this neighborhood, which seemed appropriate, um, characterized by you know masonry, um, masonry uh, openings and lintels, and a nice rhythmic proportion to to um, the windows and fenestration across the building. Um, next slide, Matt. Um, and then, sort of, hard, but one of the things that the the guidelines rec, you know, is is is, is encourages is, is actually the uh, the development of these historic theme buildings. Uh, they're they're they. They're situated close to the street. They reinforce a strong street edge. They 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 enhance the pedestrian environment. Um, parking is is either you know provided elsewhere or in, or in our case behind behind the buildings off the out of view of the street. So it seemed like a uh, a, a uh, the, the right approach for this particular site, especially given the uh, the, the masonry buildings directly across the street. Next slide, Matt. Um, and then. This is an example of, of, of one of the, a, a theme building downtown. So it's brick masonry and um, a nice detail and cornice lines, um, uh, masonry lintels, um, head, head, head lintels and sill lintels. And then just thinking about the proportions of the openings, um, uh, a, 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 clear, a clearly defined base and then windows um, uh, getting smaller in size as you move up the building to the second and third floor then a chorus line along the top. Next slide, Matt. So these are the uh, the buildings that we're we're envisioning right now. There's so there's two buildings as, as I said. There's the the uh, the three the three unit building along Phillips Place, and then below that is the two unit building on Holly Street. So we're using a combination of of uh, uh, brick and, um, and and lap siding and creating a, a, a rhythmic proportion that, that works across the buildings with the expression of the masonry and, and accenting the, the main living spaces with, a, with a, uh, nice double hung windows, um, nicely proportioned double hung windows. And, and again, the use of, of, of masonry lintels. And then, and then clearly articulating a base um, with entry and uh, sort of covered, um, co covered uh, recessed doors off the street. So uh, engaging the street edge and uh, and and again creating creating a, a, a rhythm along the streetscape with the um, the articulation of the individual units themselves. Um, this is a view looking um, down Holly Street. So on the left are the the two existing masonry buildings. Um, on the right is our uh, uh, our proposed two two unit building. On Holly Street, and then you can see sort of peeking uh, peeking out behind the, uh, the the condos that are condominiums that are currently under construction. Um, we 
Another aspect, this is a corner lot. And one of the things that the guideline, one of the aspects of, of, the, uh, of the design of these buildings that the, uh, the guidelines reference is the importance of corner lots and, and how the buildings relate to them. So what we've done here is, is, is open the corner up to become a public amenity. So there's a park um, between the uh, pocket park between the two buildings um, that invites people in um, around the corner. Um, it's a place to sit and and rest, or just or, or just you know um, impromptu conversations or meeting up with people in the neighborhood. It also will provide a, a, a pathway through, I think, between the street, um, the intersection of Holly and Phillips, and the, uh, the 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 condominiums that are currently under construction now. So act, you know, it's another pedestrian thoroughfare that will, will, will activate both developments and and the street and the neighborhood themselves. Um, this is a view looking up Phillips Place. So you see that park on the left and you can get a, you get a glimpse view through. It's get these nice kind of views through through the corridor there and um, you know, a, 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 a hint of the world beyond. And then, uh, and then this, this slide does a nice job, I think, of showing how the, uh, the rhythm of what we're proposing with these brick bays um, for each uh, unit kind of fitting into the rhythm and proportion of, of the houses up the street. So um, I think responding um, in, in a visual and sort of streetscape way that, that works nicely. Um, that's what we have for the architecture at this point. And I'm happy to answer any questions as, uh, as the evening progresses. Thanks, Charles. And uh, with that, um, that was that was our presentation. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so th the next thing that happens is that um, we're going to see if any of the members of our group have questions for you. So I'd like to if, open that up to uh, um, uh, to them. Does anybody have a question? Uh, well, I'll start. Go ahead. Um, well, I, I want to talk about several topics. The first is some of the budget numbers that were presented. Um, I'm curious why you use a 10-year hold on uh, payback. I mean, these could be financed or amortized over a longer period of time. Um, some of the costs for restoring the church, I question. Uh, I would kind of like to see some of the uh, backup information. I, some of the masonry numbers, like almost $400,000 to restore the exterior. Um, I think that could be a value engineered better. I don't think the whole church needs repointing. I agree that there are some problematic areas, but uh, some of the larger facades seem to be in good condition. Um, I also am curious about replacing the slate roof. Um, the red slate that is on there is one of the hardest and long lasting slates that there is. And I think, and I'm not a professional, but I think that roof could be restored um, at a lower cost than four hundred a half a million dollars, um, which would, the two of those factors would somewhat lower the cost of the restoration of the building and perhaps make it more affordable to rehabilitate. Um, and then the second chart you presented on the, the functional obsolescence continued on the build out costs of the five units. Um, I kind of question some of those numbers, just the wood, plastic, thermal moisture and doors and windows is over a million dollars. Um, I, this sounds a little inflated to me. Um, obviously, it's in the favor of the developers to inflate the numbers to make this look uh, more in their favor. Um, that said, I do like the presentation of the contemporary units that was just presented tonight, but I must point out that you did the same thing at the last meeting and you had a totally different schematic drawing of the potential buildings there. So I think we need to see 
that pl those plans more solidified so we're guaranteed of the look of the buildings. Even though I do really like the look and the masonry, the masonry facades of those buildings. And I commend the developers for the open space on the corner uh, and leaving some green space. I think that's very sensitive to the cityscape. That's what I'd like to say. Thank you. Uh, I, m I might um, note that in, in the last presentation, I think that the, the new design of the building was a specific response to the point that, that we made last time, that something that looked more um, in tune with the downtown themed buildings would, would be more likely to, to get our approval. Um, anyway, but um, uh, um, any other questions or, or do you want to, um, Matt, do you want to respond to what Bob said there? Sure, sure. Um, you know, and I think um, I'll try to go through and in, in which the order that you listed them. Um, but, you know, going back to this example where we were uh, measuring the rent implications on a, on a 10 year hold. Um, yes, potentially, um, you could uh, extend this hold period for, for 20 years, 25 years, 30 years, 50 years. Um, but then, uh, you know, any, anything beyond 10 years becomes, uh, you know, in, in our opinion, pure conjecture. So we wanted to, to create a, a structure and how to evaluate these where we were not including uh, mortgage interest rates. We were not including um, our return requirement. So this was, pretty much the most straightforward way that we could see as, you know, leveling the playing field and evaluating these on a, kind of on the same level. So if, if there was uh, a longer amortization or there's a longer hold period, um, you know, we could make uh, quite a few assumptions on, uh, on how that would happen. Um, but in order to do so, we would have to, you know, factor in, would it take, you know, with the 35% co-star uh, vacancy being assumed in, in 2023, um, do we assume that we're, we're carrying this with no tenant for, th for two years, we sign a five-year lease and then we're holding it again for another three years. Um, so it, it was really trying to, to uh, set this up in kind of the most straightforward way and the most, um, I think, logical way for us. And for a 10 year hold, that is um, not unrealistic uh, kind of holding period that we would evaluate. And for an investment in the restaurant field, um, we would really need a 10 year lease to justify that anyway. Um, in terms of the other kind of line items that you may feel were in inflated, we have, um, this is our business. Um, we. We have our estimating departments do hundreds of millions of dollars worth of uh, project estimation throughout the year. And this is essentially all that they do. Um, you know, to the extent that there could be um, some value engineering, uh, that might be so. Um, but when we're talking about um, rent numbers for break even between 45 and 51, uh, we would have to assume that there would be, you know, value engineer down to zero in order to get it to the current market conditions. Um, so, you know, we didn't want to go on to uh, that level of extreme either. I don't know. Was there anything else specific in terms of those line items that? Um... No, I, I... Uh, that, that's good enough comment. I appreciate your response. Thank you. Um, Pauline or Melissa, do, you, do either of you have a question you'd like to ask? Yeah, I, I just have a few comments. Um, I want to thank Tristan, um, Tristan Metcalf for his study. And again, um, for the public and historical commission responses. Um, and Matthew, that was a wonderful presentation. Um, O'Connell did meet, as, as um, Carolyn indicated in her report, uh, O'Connell's did meet 
all five of the um, conditions. So those were met. Um, and uh, they did a lot of due diligence um, with uh, Austin uh, Design. And um, I did a little bit due diligence myself on, on that par um, parcel and um, checked out the permit um, status. I did a search and um, there was the New England Urban Senior Living Center that um, tried to develop that property, um, Kent Hicks and, and, you know, and obviously O'Connell with all different types, commercial and residential. Um, uh, let's see. Just uh, one observation I made, it just seems that the new townhouse is awfully close to the church. That's, you know, neither here nor there, but, you know, I, I wish we had some pictures to see um, that. I, I don't know if it's 15 feet or what. I didn't, I saw it once and I didn't get back there to measure or, you know, to look closely, but that would be something good to look at just to see. It just seems like um, it would, take away um, natural light from the new um, townhouses. And let's see, then one thing I'm thinking of is as far as in, in our guidelines, the structural obsolescence, I think that at some point we should define structural obsolescence because um, in that presentation, they talked about the building envelope and um, a few other items. But, you know, when I think of structural obsolescence, I'm thinking of the superstructure itself. Oh, and they also talked about the masonry, um, you know, and, and I, I, don't, I don't know if the masonry is, um, you know, load bearing, but I, I, I'm picturing the superstructure is part of the structural obsolescence. So that's something that our committee can talk about at another time. Um, and then, um, I'm curious to know about phase three, if, if there is going to be a phase three for the parking lot. And I just wanted to make mention also in my researches, um, RCI did do a $24,000 um, roof repair work in, just prior to the purchase. I, I don't really know exactly when O'Connell's purchased it, but that was in 2017 when that roof repair was done. But then when you, that seems neither here nor there either because commercial and residential buildings um, both have to be brought up to the energy stretch code. So I don't know what would have to be done to that roof with those um, beautiful tiles. Um, I don't know if, you know, a vapor barrier would have to be installed or more insulation up there. Um, so that's another consideration. And um, I have two recommendations that might be out of line, but I'm thinking so everyone, meaning the public, if they could feel as though they participated to either part of a solution or went down swinging, I was thinking perhaps we can, um, uh, appoint a subcommittee to develop uh, a public outreach program just to give it our best shot to incorporate it into the VHB memorandum for not just the historic tax credit, but simply to get the um, public involved. So the VHB memorandum indicated that the um, if we can prove that there's an income, income producing reuse, then you know they would consider it as um, part of their criteria. Um, but then again, you know that's that's not all. You know the historic tax credit probably wouldn't be a lot anyways compared to the dollars that we're looking at anyways. Um, and then lastly, if we can also perhaps do another subcommittee to decide what materials can be salvaged and um, maybe put some names of the people who spent a lot of time there and 
engrave their names on the bricks and incorporate it into that um, that park that's on the corner. Um, or, or even, I don't know how well that building is documented, but perhaps, um, perhaps a hologram model or something like that and put it in the historic museum, the historic Northampton Museum. So that's all I have. Mm -hmm. uh, Pauline, how about you? Any, do you have any questions? Hey, I was talking, I hadn't realized that I was muted. So, uh, <laughs> um, I agree uh, a lot with what uh, Bob Walker had said. And I was had also questioned some of the costs of uh, replacing. I know that slate roofs are very durable and um, you know I would love to see that replaced. Uh, and not replaced, but repaired. Um, I thought that the concept renderings, um, when you were thinking of keeping the church and reusing it, were really, uh, were really wonderful. And, you know, it kind of breaks my heart that uh, the pandemic happened and, you know, two very good ideas, uh, you know, for the restaurant and entertainment and the um, brewery um, had to fall to the wayside. Um, you know, I'm, as I said at the last meeting that I'm optimistic about Northampton, uh, when I drove through town last, um, uh, the weather was still chilly and I, uh, you know, there were just, there were so many people downtown and it was just so wonderful to see, uh, you know, people coming back. You know, I do think that uh, the end of the pandemic uh, is, is approaching quickly. Uh, people are feeling more confident now that they've been vaccinated. Um, it may take some time to get back up to speed, but I do feel that Northampton will get there. And I'm thinking that, you know, Pat uh, said, you know, that he was thinking that um, it could take a couple of years to get back to where we are. And, you know, that kind of corresponds with the timeline for uh, applying for uh, tax credits. Um, you know, and lining up those people, uh, you know, who had expressed interest uh, prior to the pandemic. Um, you know, obviously, um, I, I, I am uh, representing um, the Historic Commission. We would love to see uh, the church uh, reused. Um, I know that there's a lot of support out there for doing that. And at the same time, you know, your replacement buildings, the two uh, townhouse buildings, I think they are, uh, this rendering, the most recent rendering is thought, they're thoughtfully designed. Um, uh, so uh, that is a plus, but I still feel that they're really uh, an inadequate substitute for the historic church that's there. Um, uh, the other thing that I was uh, wondering was, oh, you know, what the demolition cost is. I don't know if you addressed, you know, the cost of dem demolishing the church, which um, adds to the expense um, of, um, of, uh, of building new. Um, so I was learning about demolition cost. And I was also wondering about the tax credit issue, uh, the tax I didn't see the, you know, the possible, the potential deduction for tax credits from the expense of, uh, you know, making the building, making the existing church weather tight. And I wanted to see how that uh, stacks up to building new. So, uh, Matt, do you want to respond to that? I'm, I'd be interested to know the, the demolition costs also. Sure. So the, uh, the demolition cost for the church is uh, approximately 115000 um, But when compared to the cost to um, bring the building to weather-tight condition, um, you know, we're talking about an order of magnitude of either six to ten times. So that was, uh, you know, part of our our calculus and trying to evaluate uh, potential options. Um, and to Pauline, to your final question regarding, you know, what would the historic tax credits do in terms of, you know, if we were, so on the state level, um, 
you know, if we were to do a, a residential concept within the within the building and uh, added any demising walls, partitions, or columns, we would not be eligible to qualify for historic top tax credits. But um, just for argument's sake, if we were to receive 15% of uh, qualified expenditure of this one million. Sorry. This 882,000 would go to approximately 850,000. And uh, at that price point, we just don't have any comparable sales or market data to support that, that price. So the, the short answer is it, it would um, not do very much to move the needle. Okay. Well, the example that was given, um, and I can't remember who, uh, who did one of the studies that I saw today, earlier today, I think that they had estimated the possibility of a $1.4 million, uh, $1.4 million tax credit. Um, and so I was thinking, you know, I, that was used as an example which I didn't think was unreasonable um, because I thought that it took into consideration that you probably wouldn't be getting the full 20% um, uh, from uh, the federal, you know, from the federal tax credit. Um, so if I thought that if I had been conservative where they were estimating possibly 1.4 million, so if I, you know, if you estimated 1 million, then I thought that would make a considerable dent to the um, to the cost of uh, you know of weather uh, weatherproofing the building. I, yeah, I, the fifty thousand. I just didn't. That just doesn't seem uh, reason accurate to me. But. That that's on a on a per unit. Oh, okay. All right. So if, um, if there's no other questions from the um, uh, board at the moment, it's now time for me to open up um, for public comment. Before I do, however, I wanna say um, a few things. Um, first of all, this is a continuation of the hearing that we had before. So if you spoke before, um, you don't need to um, make the comment again. Um, if you sent a letter into the um, into the board, we uh, we have received the letters and we have read the letters. You don't need to um, read them into the meeting. Um, I uh, um, the 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 city ordinance under which we operate gives us a very specific role in, in this um, process here. And really the only thing that we are um, charged to decide tonight is whether the developer has um, shown us that the building is um, uh, functionally obsolete and not practical to reuse. So that's really the only thing that we that is in front of us to decide. Um, we don't have um, uh, uh, we don't have the ability to to delay demolition like the uh, uh, like the Elm Street um, uh, committee of the historical commission does. So um, we're also uh, the the um, uh, the popularity of um, the church is not really an issue that, uh, for us to decide. We have to, de our decision is based on whether the developer has met the criteria under the ordinance. And um, so uh, it's, um, it's, it's the, um, I ask the public to understand that we're, we're very much constrained um, as to what we can do here. Um, the uh, uh, let's see if there's there's anything else I am 
uh, I'm, I'm going to ask people to limit themselves to no more than three minutes of comment. I, I know that there's a lot of people here and a lot of people who weren't here um, um, before. So um, uh, uh, that said, um, please limit yourself to no more than three minutes. And, and please um, uh, don't repeat what you said last time. This is this meeting is to is to comment on new information that was presented tonight. So I think the first person with his hand up is Jim Nash. Would you like to speak? Thank you, Joe. Um, so let me pull my notes up here. Joe, when I hit three minutes, let me, okay? And don't start till I start talking. <laughs> okay. We already started. <laughs> All right, I'm going. All right. So I have a number of things to report. First, an anonymous don't a gift of up to fifty thousand dollars is on offer towards action saving St. John Cantius with any surplus to forestall a similar crisis with St. Mary's. There is twenty thousand twenty thousand dollars will be deposited with the Community Foundation of Western Massachusetts to be used for tax deductible grants. For example, to the Ward 3 Neighborhood Association or to the city. 30,000 will be available for non deductible uses. For example, direct expenses of the developer or payments to consultants. At the donor's discretion, possible uses for the funds include, but are not limited to, building and reuse assessments, communications with banks, donors, and government agencies, marketing the properties stabilizing the building while it awaits renovation. All that the donor asked is that O'Connell and the city join with the community in augmenting this gift through in-kind donations of time, energy, and enthusiasm as we all work towards a positive solution which saves St. John's and contributes to Northampton and to the neighborhood where Holly Manor's new residents will live. That's uh, new information number one. Number two, I spoke with Mons Monsignor Bogzani with the Diocese of Springfield. The Monsignor represents the diocese around legal matters such as deed restrictions. The Monsignor shared with me the intent is to avoid the intent of these restrictions to avoid what happened to a church in Manhattan that was sold to a private party that turned a club called the Limelight, uh, which he said featured topless dancing. That's the, that's the impetus for the deed restrictions. I inquired with the Monsignor about various use scenarios such as a CVS or an art house, uh, art house theater, a movie theater. The Monsignor said he did not feel it was appropriate to get into a back and forth with me about this, but would happy to do so with O'Connell as the new property owner. The Monsignor went on to share that he has had no conversations with O'Connell around any use proposals since the sale of the property. Um, I'd also like to add, um, you know, first of all, I really appreciate much more detail in the presentation here. Um, I think it requires further time for review. I especially wonder about the park, it, uh, the, the pocket park. Um, I'm, uh, I want to make sure that if we're talking about a public space, that it is indeed a public space and not something that is seen as that, advertised as that right now and later um, ha is fenced off and used by the condo association. The last thing I want to share is that Amy K. Lane shared with the Ward 3 Association and with the Chamber Association information about downtown uh, business um, or retail businesses. And by and large, we're doing okay that they're, that we've lost businesses and they've been replaced, that we're, we're on, we, there's not a huge loss. Um, this is one of the few, few times I'll disagree with Pat publicly, but that um, many of the vacancies are all one owner. And I'm very grateful that uh, Pat is now representing that owner to find uh, tenants for those spaces. And I think that explains why um, he's seen such an increase in his um, commercial stock. Um, so anyway, those are my comments. I actually said it under three minutes. Thank you, everybody. Have a great night. Thank you, Thank you Jim. I um, actually, I don't see another hand up, but maybe um, Carolyn, do, uh, 
okay, Garrett, it's it's uh, up to you. Okay. Yeah. Um, Joe, just before, um, if you could just have people um, use the uh, reactions button to uh, electronically raise their hand instead of waving because there are three pages of faces. Yeah, can... So once you use the electronic version, it'll pop you up to the top of the screen. So um, that's the easiest way to be able to recognize people. Hey, Garrett, you're on. Okay. Yeah, um, I, I realize that I've now sent two letters, so I won't uh, reiterate anything in those communications. Um, so I, I just had a couple of things that struck me when I read through the filing from O'Connell um, for this meeting. Um, one is the contrast between the assessment of the current uh, retail and commercial market conditions that, that Pat um, described. Um, and I went and looked at the hallymanor.com site where they are marketing these units. And I'll just quote from that. Quote, new to town, discover a welcoming community rich in history that's both friendly and sophisticated. The arts, music, and academia thrive in Northampton, and there is never a lack of lively conversation in our cafes, galleries, and shops. There's a tempting array of restaurants and an epic farmer's market to channel your inner gourmet. So I just find that contrast rather striking, and I, 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 O'Connell uh, company is fairly uh, intelligent, and I don't think that they would be sinking millions of dollars into a project in a town that they thought was dying. Um, I also looked at some of the prices for the units uh, that they're offering, uh, that they're currently building. And I come up with uh, 11 interior units at $720,000, uh, it's a minimum price, 10 exterior units at uh, 700,000 uh, and two end exterior units at 750,000. Um, moderated those prices a little bit because they, they only get prices for two examples. Um, so the total of expected sales is over $16 million of residential properties. So uh, when I read over the uh, analysis of the cost of uh, reusing St. John and, and particularly the five market rate dwellings that were uh, laid out um, I was really depressed <laughs> at the per unit cost that they would have to get. But then if you look at, um, you know, $882,000 for a really distinctive unit in an historic building in our historic town, um, it becomes a little less uh, of, a, of a stretch. I also noticed that they folded in a bunch of the costs uh, into the uh, estimates, uh, broker commissions, $76,000 in earthwork on what is a pretty level site. And they also allocated to the church lot a quarter of the original land purchase price. They already own it. Um, and some of those prices, expenses occur with demolition or without. Um, so I would also kind of cavil with the uh, active and continuously marketed uh, statement. And, and I, I don't uh, question Pat's involvement at all, but I do know that many, uh, several community entities were trying to find out a price for years. Um, and I went with the Arts Center Board in 2010, and uh, I looked on my own behalf and had a very hard time getting solid answers about the property. Um, so I just want to make one final point, which is that a lot of the analysis that O'Connell presented relate to a particular moment in time and a particularly grim one. And I just don't want a building that's been there for 100 years to fall victim to a moment in time. Um, it's, it should endure, and I think it can endure. And I thank everybody for their time. Thanks. Okay, thank you, Garrett. Uh, Tris Metcalf is up next. Tris, you're on. Tris, are you there? Yes, unmute himself. Uh, you I have to unmute. Find my unmute button. Sorry. 
Yeah, it's Tris Metcalf. I'm an architect in town. I've been practicing here for, oh my goodness, I don't know, 40 years. Uh, seen a lot of historic buildings disappear in Northampton. It's really sad to see another one go. Um, I, it, if, if someone wants to get rid of a building, they can come up with all the reasons, all the numbers, all the reports they want from any consultant they pay to justify it. So it, it's, it appears they just don't want to reuse the building. I think that they can reuse it and make a decent profit. I, it's absolutely not true what was said about you cannot get tax credits if you alter the interior. That is not true at all. Um, we did uh, tax credits on a church in Turner's Falls, uh, the St. Anne Church. We, got, we were awarded $2.32 million in just the tax credits back into their pocket. The project died, unfortunately, because of recession. Now, <clears throat> one thing I don't think that has been done tonight had by the developer is to show us a reuse of the church as condominiums, high-end condominiums. Four to or five to six condominiums could go in there. And it's true that historic churches that have been turned into residential units get very high prices. It, the, these could be the most valuable units in the $60 million project. So I think that what needs to be done is to have a study done of high-end residential units uh, with accurate numbers, you know, not showing asbestos. Asbestos has to, be, has to be abated whether you tear it down or reuse it. So that number is totally not relevant. And you know the, the, the water stains, yeah, every building can get leaks and they just need to be fixed. And, so it's, it, it, again, it's just trying to stretch an argument for the purpose of demolition. Churches are the most elegant buildings on this planet. People travel all over the world to see historic buildings and the churches are the pinnacle of that, that uh, tourist effort. Destroying this church is a, what would be called urban vandalism. It's crime. It's an absolutely a crime to civilization. Whether it's legal or not, well, of course. I mean, we have laws, and I'm sure it can be done legally. But I think the the point is, the building can be reused. You know, pointing a building and fixing some tiles and some flashing is a ridiculous reason to tear a building down. Absolutely, um, I I don't believe it at all. The numbers are inflated. Uh, Robert pointed that out. Bob Walker pointed that out. And um, I just really would hope that the developer with all the money they're making, with all the units on this built, this property, that they could find it in their heart or in their conscience to try and save an asset of civilization rather than just creating more profit. And, you know, I don't want to go on much longer. I, you know, it's, it's, um, it's, it's just really a, a sad, unfortunate thing that I see happening before me. I've been practicing architecture for 50 years. Most of my work is historic preservation. Um, it's, it's, you know, we got, we got a half a million dollars just from doing the interior of the roundhouse. Nothing historic at all about it. It was just interior work, mechanical, new offices, lighting, half a million dollars in tax credits for the roundhouse. So that argument has not been explored. So I, they have not presented the potential here. Chris, it's been three, it's been more than Thank three you. minutes. Okay. Um, so I see Fredaldi, I think is the, uh, I, it's a little hard for me to read on my screen. Um, I think it looks like you're yeah, muted. Yeah, it's uh, actually, actually uh, yep, there you go. It, uh, it, it's Fred Zimnock. I live in uh, the Federal Historic District uh, in Northampton, but I have Maria Tomasco here, our, our former city uh, councilwoman. She wants to speak for a few minutes. Thank you. Um, I want to say first that um, uh, I have served the committee for more than two decades, I've served the city for more than two decades and spent uh, uh, four or more years as counselor. And I can tell you that um, 
though my name is Tomasko, I am in fact not Polish. Um, my maiden name is Fleming. And at the same time, I'm highly sensitive to the importance of this city to the Poles. And I think to take down this church, which was a central part of Polish culture, I think is an incredible travesty of an important part of the city's history and the history of our residents. I strongly urge us not to do this. Um, we were kind of hoodwinked into agreeing to let the um, uh, to let there be a change in zoning that would allow all the small um, uh, units uh, to replace um, uh, the um, the building um, for the priests, um, and we were told no problem. Definitely the church will be maintained and we will keep it and find a good purpose for it. We were just apparently totally uh, lied to. And um, I don't think that's the right thing to do to one of the, um, uh, one of the major areas of Northampton. Um, if, however, if we were going to get rid of the church, and build a bunch of little small buildings that would go around that corner. We should remember that this area is zoned um, commercial and all of those little buildings should have um, stores on the first floor. The idea of turning this whole area into little buildings that are used for um, people to live in instead of the proper zoning um, is a complete travesty. Anyway, as I say, I think that our neighborhood got hoodwinked by all of this. I think that um, we have to look much more uh, clearly at the importance of this church to our population, to our history, to the beauty of our buildings in this city and to think of it also as um, uh, buildings that will, or the main building anyway, can be income producing uh, to all of us. There's a lot more I could say, but I think that sums up where I'm at. And by the way, the reason Fred should get to speak now or some other time is because we're actually sharing um, um, some, um, uh, we're sharing the, the uh, computer here. There you go. I may speak later. I just may speak later. You're on mute, Joe. Up next, I guess, is Jackie Balance. Yes, thank you. Um, I thought the uh, Donald's uh, presentation was very, very interesting, and I would really be enthusiastic about it, except that it requires a demolition of an extraordinarily beautiful and beloved landmark. Um, I agree with what Tris said, that this church could be turned into some very high-end condos. He could get his $800,000 for a 2,000-square-foot condo there in a church. We did, um, we turned a jail into condos that people found desirable. Surely um, a church is worth it. Uh, someone's even offered cash to begin the preservation. I agree with the suggestion that was made to um, continue this conversation with more community involvement. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I don't. Is, do we have anybody else who has? Joella uh, Tar button is waving. Anybody else who wants to speak? Is there? I don't see any other hands raised. Joella um, Tar button. Is waving. Yes. Hi, hi, everyone. My name is Joella Tar button. I'm a proud member of the Ward Three. What I'd like to do is 
uh, have Roy Martin because he's getting on my nerves. He will speak. Yes. Yeah. Good evening, everyone. Uh, I just came from over by the church. I was out there. I was trying to get my iPad to work, but my iPad uh, seems to have a problem. So uh, I think that the church should be saved. I think we should put a one year moratorium on it. And that way there, it can't be tore down for one year. And if nothing else, you know, if we could find a place to move the church to, I know in Amherst, they're moving big buildings around. And so if we had a place to move it to, and we could find land in that one year and find someone that would move it, all right, then that would be a good idea there. If not, right, there could be other uses for it. I mean, that is a beautiful building. Uh, my great grandfather worked on that building uh, many years when the Indians were here. So uh, I think myself, yes, it should be saved. Uh, you know, well, look it up the other end of town. Eric Sauer bought that church up there and he's remodeled it and everything and done a beautiful job on it. Uh, anybody that knows that church up there, uh, you know. Uh, if he could do it, then anyone could do it, all right? And remodel it and make a better, make something of it. So uh, that's about all I can figure on is let's save it. Let's do what we can to save it. If we gotta have, if we gotta raise money, right? You know, let's have, let's start a GoFundMe page or something like that. See how much money we can raise and put towards it. And uh, I didn't catch this whole thing, so I heard that somebody somebody had pledged ten thousand dollars or fifty thousand dollars to uh, rebuild it, which would be great. Uh, you know, if I'm ever elected mayor, then I hope I will get to see that. So uh, have a good one, and everyone be happy, and everyone be safe. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, does, is, there, is there any other member of the public who would like to comment? I don't see any other hands raised. Um, since not, let me, um, let me go back to Matt and um, just, uh, I assume that you hadn't heard about this quarter million dollar offer um, before tonight, maybe you had, I don't know. Um, could I just, uh, hear your reaction to it. So I, I don't know if it was a quarter million dollars. Um, um, was it? I thought I did. I hear two hundred and fifty or, or Jim? Was it? Was it was it one less zero. Was it one less zero. And that I was mean, fifty thousand. It was fifty thousand. Okay. I'm 50, sorry. Fifty dollars. I'm going deaf in my old age and uh, sometimes, okay. you know, I guess I hear what I want to hear sometimes instead of what people do. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I appreciate the opportunity to respond to that. Um, you know, we, we have spent um, between um, the feasibility studies and our own third party consultants in excess of uh, $50,000. Um, so it would not, um, for, for us would not, uh, change our opinion at this point. Um, so does anybody, do any of the members of the other members of the committee have other questions or concerns they want to bring up? Hey, Joe, it's, and, and Pat, could I, could I just have a point of clarification just briefly? Joe? Go, go ahead, Pat. So just, again, just quickly in terms of Garrett's comment, if I, if I, uh, misspoke and said uh, and anyone left with the impression that I thought that downtown was dead. I really uh, did not communicate well tonight because that clearly is not what I feel at all. And I, I think I suggested a number of different ways and I'm cautiously optimistic yet. I think the timeline that's been suggested for our recovery is um, still a ways out there in terms of a year or two down the road. So I did want to clarify that. And I apologize if I left that wrong impression um, with Garrett or anyone else. And secondly, the question that Garrett raised about getting into the building and not being able to get into the building, I can't, can't take any credit for that because I did not list the building. The building was listed with a Springfield broker 
and that was the means by which people who, including myself, who wanted to look at it or show it to others would uh, uh, take to uh, get the appointments made to do so. So I did, uh, since he mentioned that as well, I, I did want to clarify that point. Thank you. Thank you, Pat. Um, so the, the question before us now is whether um, we feel, the committee feels that O'Connell has um, uh, effectively made their case that the building really can't realistically be reused and um, that therefore we should uh, uh, go ahead and give them a permission to demolish it. Um, do you, do um, uh, uh, Bob, Melissa, um, and um, uh, um, um, would, uh, oh, we have another somebody else who wants to speak, I'm sorry. Elaine? Elaine Moggio, you have a, um, yes, you're my, up if you want to speak. My name's, hi. Can you, Hi. My name's Elaine Mojo Jandu, and I started a petition last week, and it already has over 600 people that have signed that are totally against the demolition of this gorgeous church. And I really think that needs to be taken into consideration how the public feels about this church. It's it's a gorgeous building. It's, it's so unusual, the architecture of it. And uh, that's what I wanted to say. I just think there's a lot of public people that want to do something about this. And whatever it takes, we'll do, we'll do a GoFundMe page. We'll do um, federal grants through the sacred. But something needs to be done. I really believe that. It's just too beautiful of, of a building to just destroy it. Thank you. Okay, I believe there is, uh, let's see. Um, looks like we have somebody else who wishes to speak, uh, Richard Wagner. Hi, um, so quick, um, I appreciate the difficulty of taking a big old building like this and turning it around. Um, and I appreciate that um, Pat Goggins and the developers have been in town for a while and they care about the town, but you know, you have a banging website and I'll quote from it. Um, one line, style that lasts are the most important built-ins in this community. Um, you know, we've been here for like 26, 27 years, something like that. And it is the community that you as developers are selling. You're not, I mean, okay, you're selling a building, you're selling swell apartments, but you're selling a community. And I think for this to go forward at all, be it demolition or be it reuse, you have to have the community, if not behind you, at least understanding you, um, you know, I think back to a couple of years ago, uh, the brouhaha about the park and the hotel that was going up there. Um, I think one of the things I've learned in my years in Northampton is that if you're gonna sell the community, you have to respect the community. And that means you have to do as much outreach as you can. Um, and I'm not gonna tell you how you might do that, um, but uh, for sure, there are going to be many, many unhappy people if that church comes down because there have been dirt births there, there have been funerals there. It has a far, far deeper meaning than a lot of the other historic buildings um, in town. So that's all I have to say. Thanks. Thank you, Richard. Um, we have another comment from Deborah Hansen. Deborah, you're on. Um, I'm the oh. current president of Ward 3 Neighborhood Association. And I wasn't going to speak, but since we're still talking, I will just say briefly, we did submit a letter to your committee, and I know you have read it. Joe said you did, and I believe you have. 
um, our committee, our association has taken a vote and our, we have listserv of over 300 people. I can't say that we've polled everybody, but we have gotten a lot of feedback and the board of directors asked me to just reiterate what our letter conveyed that we, you know, we would work with you in any way. As Jim Nash said, I think this could be a community effort, people pitching in. We have successfully raised money rather quickly, actually, it surprised me, um, to build a new school sign, um, $6,500 present to the city. There are ways to raise money in this city. And our board of directors, and I believe most of our lists serve, we just feel strongly that this church should be repurposed in some fashion. And I know the struggles, I, I think your presentation, Matt and, and the designer, you guys had a great presentation. I think it was a lot more detailed than February meeting that I attended. And I know that, that it's a tough, tough situation to try to do it, but I just wish that we could work at it a little bit longer and try to come up with some alternatives that we could use this church and keep this church alive in our community. That's all I have to say, thanks. Okay. Is there anybody else that wanted to speak? Because if not, I think it's probably time for us to close the public meeting and then um, have a little bit more back and forth. I don't... Um, hello, hello, this is Mark. Here we have somebody. Yes, yes. Uh, I don't know how to raise my hand on here and I don't have a video on my camera, uh, my computer, uh, but I just wanted to. Um, Could you state your, whole, your full my name? name is, for my name is Mark Moggio. And I just wanted to say that I, I looked at the figures. I looked at the presentation that Matt made and, you know, I agree that a lot of these figures can be skewed and can be, um, made to look like it's gonna cost so much money. Uh, I think Bob Walker said, I, I agree with Bob on a lot of these figures. Um, and, you know, he talked about one level of that church of 6,400 square feet. Well, obviously they would be building other internal levels in that church. So it would increase the square footage and therefore increase the amount of money they could make in that church. So it, he presents himself well, uh, but I don't think it's a, a complete picture. Um, it's, a com it's a picture that makes tearing down the church uh, look like it's the only way out. And I, I truly believe that that's not the case here. And that's all I wanted to say. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Is there anybody else who wishes to speak? Thank you. Speak now or forever hold your peace, as the saying goes. Oh, did I see it? Oh, Florida Jeff. Sorry, Florida I can't. Jeff. Hi, this is Jeff Zessiger, and I'm Ward 3. Um, I can't change my name for some reason on the screen tonight, so sorry about the Florida. Um, your question, Joe, is do we have enough information to um, make an informed decision, basically, is what I'm hearing. And what I'm hearing is that we have different opinions about how much it would take to rehabilitate the church so it would be sound enough to then build. Um, it would be nice, maybe with the seed money, to find out, is there someone else could come in and give a second opinion about the numbers and say, these are realistic numbers, Yes, we have to. We should listen to uh, Matt and his group. Or no, they they aren't that realistic, including the costs of dividing up the church, making, for instance, condos there. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Jeff. Um, I uh, think Terry Matt. I think Terry Masterson is um, wanting to speak. Thank you. Terry, you okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Can you yeah. hear me? It would be good to know 
the total value of the project, all the pieces of the project, from a, re from a gross revenue point of view and a net revenue point of view. Yeah. What? Who's ready to do that? Uh, I can tell you it'll cost. Um, somebody needs to mute themselves. Maddie, iPhone, uh, I think. Yeah. It's gone, Terry. It would give everybody a clear picture of the value of the project and whether, as has been discussed when it when when the project was up for its previous approval, whether there was enough of a margin to address the renovation and preservation of the church building. I think we don't know all the value because we don't know what will happen to the Phillips Place lot. We don't know what the taking prices will be for some of the condo units. We do know the asking prices, which on the website are above $700,000 for a 2,000 square foot unit. So I, so I think that we want to understand what the total value is to understand if fixing the church and preserving it is a heavy lift for the developer or for the community. Second point to make is obviously accuracy and knowing whether the numbers we're, we're, we're seeing are real or whether they're different. And I'm not suggesting that they're not. I'm just saying it's, it would be good to have that data and information that, that we can all agree on. They're clearly, point three, there clearly is interest in the building. I don't know that retail or a restaurant is ever going to work, but residential conversion, I know of one developer who is looking very closely at that church from a residential development point of view. Is he going to buy the church? Would he buy the church? I can't say, but I can say he's very serious about it. And that leads to my fourth point. There are so many examples of, res of churches in the state of Massachusetts that have been converted to residential that it begs the question why somehow this building doesn't fit, why this building doesn't work. There's six buildings alone in Pittsfield that have been converted to residential condominiums, apartments, well above the size of this church. So again, those are my points and thank you for letting me say a few things. Thank you, Terry. So it looks like we have Matthew Welter who's uh, uh, wanting, Matthew. Yeah, thanks, Joe. If I can just respond to a, a oh, couple I'm of sorry. comments. <laughs> I didn't, realize it was, I didn't realize it was that Matthew, sorry. Right, right, if, if, I, if I can quickly, um, would it be possible to, to share my screen? Um, I, Carolyn, yeah, there you go. So there's, there's, a, there's a couple of sentiments that I think, um, one of them being from, from Garrett, and I do appreciate the, the, the concern that you have um, concerning, uh, you know, I think this is, this is one point in time. Um, I would only like to remind the public that this is, this is actually not uh, one point in time. It's been actively marketed and um, open to, to bid for the last 10 years. Um, that would be you know, a kind of point number one. Um, I, I think there was a comment in terms of St. Anne's Church um, in Turner Falls, and we've actually researched that property and it was part of our our VHB cultural resource uh, response. And I, based on our research, um, there was no record of, from the Mass Historic Credit um, approving state funding. And so I, I can't speak to the accuracy of, of that comment. Um, so there, it looks like uh, that was never um, approved. So the, the funding level or the, um, the idea that uh, this did receive funding is in direct conflict with, with our records. Um, I think the other point too uh, to be made is that, um, you know, if the, the, the criteria is to understand the, the overall um, value or, or sellout of the entire project, um, you know, in our opinion, that would be that would be part of the demolition criteria, but um, as we've shown, um, you know, despite us being, you know, very confident in uh, investing our capital in Northampton, we do not believe there's a market for a 885,000 um, break-even unit with no off-street parking. Um, 
So the place that it would put us in is, is an unproven market with no data or comps. Um, and as I mentioned before, essentially uh, unsellable. Um, the other, you know, I think uh, question on, on the inflation or, or the idea that our rent numbers might be uh, beyond what is, what is available. Um, I just have to go back to the point that uh, our estimating group has done over hundreds of millions of dollars in estimation um, across various product types. Um, and so we're confident in these numbers and believe they're, they're relevant. Um, and I think the last point in terms of um, how can there be projects that are done, uh, conversion of churches and not work here? Um, this, I think there was a citation to Pittsfield um, in my conversations with David Carver, who is an active uh, real estate developer that does do church conversions. Those projects in, P in Pittsfield are funded through a combination of TIFs tax incremental financing um, or pilots in addition to the housing development incentive program. So uh, his project in Pittsfield is considered a gateway city. Northampton is not a gateway city. Um, so we would be ineligible for the same type of funding sources that um, David Carter has, take, Carver has taken advantage of for his developments. Okay, um, Tris, you've got your hand up. You already okay. spoke, but if you wanted to just say something quickly, it would be yes, yes, okay. Real quick, I just wanted to clear up for Matt. Um, I don't know how he did his research, but the $2.32 million that we were awarded by the uh, Massachusetts Store Commission um, was for a project for a performing arts center, which the church was essentially left largely intact, small addition in front, but it also included a directory and a connecting building and some kitchens and so forth. So it was a larger expense, but uh, I can very uh, be happy to get you the documentation of that if you would like. Um, and uh, it'd be nice to, I would like to actually look for documentation of other churches and what kind of sales those units get. I think you can make a lot of money here, Matt. And um, I definitely believe that the removing the demolition costs and just doing maintenance and then with the build out you're already planning to spend, um, it's pretty much a slam dunk. And I know you don't want to, I know you're being honest and you don't believe it'll work, but I would encourage you to look again and see that it can. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Tris. Do we have anybody else who wishes to make a comment? If not, I'm going to ask for a motion that we close the public hearing. There's one. Uh, is one of our, our members gonna make a uh, motion to close the public hearing? Did Terry wanna say something else? Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't get, I didn't see that. Can you Go ahead, me? yeah. I wanted to respond to Matt, and that is that Not a every renovation of church is going to be different. The financing is going to be different. I have no dispute with that. The fact is that the enormity of churches that have been renovated in the state of Massachusetts, repurposed to residential in Boston, Newton, Pittsfield, Adams, it just begs the fact that why can't that work here? That's point one. Point two is this project right now is at $20 million based on asking prices. And that's not including the redevelopment of the Phillips Place parcel, which is 12,000 square feet. And it's not including the development of the church. I find if you did a gap analysis, just so that everybody could see, here's all the revenues, here's the cost of construction, here's the net, and here's the cost of putting the church and getting it onto a condominium or residential footing, there might be enough room for us to reach common ground and preserve this church. Now, is the developer being asked to forego something? Yes, but I think that goes on in a lot of projects, certainly have gone in a lot of projects in this city where there have been lots of concessions, givebacks, extractions that have gone on all the time. It goes on in communities across the United States. The idea that somehow this project would be exempt 
from that kind of a conversation is also something that everybody should think about. Why is that so? Okay, thank you. Are there any other comments from the public? If not, I would entertain a motion to close the public hearing. I think Fred Oldley's old trying to talk. Fred too. Oh, Fred's I'm there. sorry. Fred's in there. Did, uh, did Fred you have mute. Fred? Fred, you are on mute. Did, Fred, did you have something else to say? Yeah, I just have a quick question. Is this meeting being recorded? Yes, it is being recorded. And we can find it where? On the city's website, there'll be a link to it somewhere. Thank you. Yep. If there are no other comments, Joe? would somebody like to make a motion to close the public hearing? Joe, excuse me, Joe? Joe? Yes. Yes, I, before the meeting is closed to the public, I'd like to ask and say something. Uh, uh -huh. I'm wondering if this meeting potentially could be continued again to allow a feasibility study to be done, maybe paid for through Jim Nash's donor or patron. It would also give the O'Connell an opportunity to put together more presentation drawings of the potential residential development there. Um, our guidelines say that, you know, the, the three points saying a new building also has to be designed to replace the building to be demolished. We see a schematic drawing, which is a nice presentation, but it's not an architectural presentation of which we've had some issues. I think if we could continue this meeting for potentially two or three months, it would give the public sector an opportunity to put together a proposal. If they had that money available, they could hire another architectural estimating firm to run the numbers to make sure there is all validity there, which some people question. Um, because this is a big decision and it's difficult for four of us to make a decision to take down this church. And I personally have a very difficult time making that decision. Um, I'd like to see potentially more proposals. You have to agree that when O'Connell got the property, part of the agreement was to reuse the church. So instead of making you know, a decision in one month, I know this has been another uh, delay of, the meet of this decision, perhaps it would make the public feel better about what's going on if we gave this a little more time. And I'd like to hear the other committee members' comments on that. Could I actually, I also, I'd like to get uh, Carolyn's comment on that, whether, whether that's something that we are, we would be able to do also. Um, I think, so you can continue the meeting if the applicant, um, is agreeable to pursue, you know, that um, a secondary feasibility study um, and continue it. If you feel like there may be a threat, I mean, this is, you heard from the applicant that they've done their feasibility analysis. Um, you're, but, um, you know, I'm not sure if you're saying the city should take this on and do a parallel feasibility analysis. I don't, that's not our um, no, that's not job to do that on behalf of the applicant. But the applicant has to agree to continuation, whether or not you want the feasibility study and whether or not that's real money and it's out there and would be beneficial. The applicant has to be willing to accept the continuation. You also are well within your means to make a decision now, either way. And the applicant has heard you know, one member of the committee make <laughs> this pitch. Um, if you, for example, feel like the criteria in the ordinance has not been met, you can certainly um, note where there are gaps in what you feel have not been met and take a vote on that. That doesn't bar the applicant from coming back with another application um, 
to try to address those concerns. Um, but it's, um, you know, so I just leave it at that. I guess. Okay. Um, we have a, a Jonathan Brody, you have your hand up. You wanted to make a comment? Yeah, sorry. Uh, literally, Johnny come lately here. Um, I just, my comment was actually in support of the committee members' uh, recommendation that was just made. It just seems like just give everyone a little bit more time um, on this. And I, you know, I can sympathize with the developer. It's kind of been sitting there for 10 years and now it's kind of action time. But, you know, that's just sometimes how these things unfold, you know, that, you know, when push comes to shove and, you know, looking at the, you know, uh, potentially the, you know, the demise of the building that everyone really loves. And, and I think the public sentiment, at least ours, was that when that kind of area was being bought and developed, that the church was going to kind of stay with it. And this is certainly a change. So I think in some ways, this notion that there's been all this time, you know, um, you know, and nothing's kind of been done, I think is somewhat irrelevant because the circumstances have changed. So lastly, and just to kind of finish up again, I think just giving this more time and giving the opportunity to kind of take a second look at what can be done, I think makes a lot of sense and just really appreciate, uh, I think it's B Walker. I, I, sorry, I, sorry, I don't know your name, but I thought it was really thoughtful. And I think something like that should, a delay should be, you know, pursued. Thanks. Okay. Um, are there any other public members of the public that want to give a comment? If not, I would entertain a motion to close the hearing and then we could discuss the continuation issue. Um, let me just say that you can't close the hearing if there's a possibility that you're going to continue okay. it. I'm sorry. Yeah. I, so I, I think, you know, it might make sense to ask. Um, Okay, uh, so Matt, if um, that he would be willing to have a continuation um, or, or what the sentiments are there. And then, you know, if you do decide to go down the continuation path, then it would stay open because it would be open to the public okay. still and I, feedback coming. I should, I should have realized that. I'm sorry. So, Matt, would you like to comment on the um, on on Bob's idea? Yeah, I, uh, I, you know, I, I do appreciate the, the sentiment um, and, and uh, the feeling of, you know, feasibility. Um, the issue is that we've, we've gone through our own feasibility studies and it's been exhaustive. And one of the, the pieces that I think is missing on uh, all this discussion is that, you know, we're funding this through private equity. Um, this, is, this is based on our own investment dollars. So the feasibility study, I'm not sure, uh, really weighs the the market. Um, it would be, I guess, presumably another another test fit of which we've we've done many, um, without proving that there's there's a market or, um, you know, an end in sight. So it would, I think, be really even at its best would be 50% of of what we're looking to do um, because, um, you know, whether a, a hypothetical test fit would work, that does not give us comfort in who would construct it, um, who would sell it, um, and who would be our end user. Um, and I think, you know, despite the offer of the feasibility study, the, the results or the conclusions from that um, will, will not give anyone comfort, um, especially us, on who would be willing to uh, be an end user or who would be able to, to, um, to purchase the property. Um, you know, I think it's essentially, you know, putting us in a position where we're uh, kind of stepping out beyond the criteria of the, of the design guidelines um, and adding factors that uh, were not part of that criteria. So, excuse me. Oh, sorry, Bob, go ahead. No, I just want, would O'Connell uh, consider selling the church if another developer wanted to make a purchase agreement to uh, maintain the church and develop it? Um, you know, in these, in these hypotheticals, um, I, you know, I guess anything's possible. Um, but so far, we've been the only ones that have, have 
stepped up and, and uh, put, put the deal under contract and, bro and broken ground. Yeah. But you must acknowledge the public uh, sentiment about this is very strong against it. And I'm curious about what your reaction is to the public. I, I appreciate the, uh, the, the emotion that's attached to the, to the church, the former church. You know, I, I know it's been a landmark uh, within the city and it's, and it's anchored that corner. Um, there's, there's no question on that. And, um, you know, we've, we're, we're a local development company. We've been here for 142 years. So we, and we have investment and ownership in Northampton. So we, we do understand, um, you know, why people are saying what they're saying and then, and the, and the protests over its eventual or, or our application for demolition. Um, but I would, only, I would only say is that, um, you know, we're looking forward to, to developing, um, you know, a well-built, um, I think thoughtfully designed uh, replacement property and we'll be able to, you know, potentially return that, um, that corner to, I think a consistent use with the, with the built environment. I think the, the, the size and scale of our proposed uh, townhomes and what Charles uh, presented, I think is consistent with the area. I think it's additive to the area. I think it um, provides, um, you know, a potential consumer base for uh, the retail that we all wanna see be raised. Um, so while I can absolutely appreciate um, a lot of the, the dissenters, um, we, we, you know, it's in our opinion that we're we're going to be we're going to be able to to build something that we're proud of and that we think the the rest of the community will be proud of. Okay, we have another uh, requested comment from Deb Henson. You you did speak before, so but but if if you want to say something very briefly, it'll be okay. Yeah, just very briefly. Because I, I noted that things have changed. Um, Matt said that the, the church was on the market for 10 years, but as I understand it, it wasn't just the church. And so someone had said, and I don't remember the name, that tonight, that there would be possible buyers for just the church who could repurpose it. And that there's a lot more information about churches that have been used in this state that seems like missing information to me. If that's a possibility that O'Connell would sell just the church, you still have the parcel across the street on Phillips. You still have the development that you're currently building. That is a completely different sale package than it was when you bought it. And I don't know that that's possible, but I don't know that I mean, somebody said they think somebody might be interested in doing that with a church. So, you know, are we completely sure that, that it's been thoroughly investigated? I would, I would just say, and, and somebody on the, your committee said, why not have a subcommittee, you know, investigate this? So anyway, I think those are some good ideas to, to explore. Thank you. Okay. Um, if there's no other public comment, um, so I interpret your lengthy answer, Matt, as a no to the question of extending the hearing. Uh, yes, that's right. Sorry, I should have been clearer. <laughs> okay. Um, in that case, could I would entertain a motion to close the public hearing if, somebody, if one of our members would like to make it. I make a motion to close the public hearing. Would, would somebody second it? Oh, second. All in favor, raise your hands. Or do we have to, do have to take a roll call, call vote. Okay, so yeah. um, Robert uh, Walker, I say aye. Colleen Melissa? Fogel says aye. Melissa Fridlow, yay. And I, Joe Blumenthal, also say yes. So now um, uh, we should have. Um, a discussion about this, I guess. Uh, I um, uh, would anybody like to to um, to uh, to start the discussion? Does anybody have anything to say? 
Yeah, I have um, three things just to summarize what I heard tonight. And again, Carolyn, you can tell us if, um, if we can even do something like this, but in uh, our guidelines, um, the central business design guidelines, um, section 156.4, subsection B, it says the central business architecture committee shall have the authority to appoint a subcommittee or agent in behalf of the full committee for any action that does not require a public hearing. So that, you know, essentially would extend any kind of decision and there have to be someone to organize it and then perhaps involve the the public in a charrette and we can address uh and an, 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 well, i'll say a separate thing is um terrence's um gap analysis um all five items were addressed um but then uh number five in uh, subsection D, it says that detailed description of any financial hardship. So if that wasn't enough information, then perhaps we can get a gap analysis showing the revenue and, and the um, uh, expenditures and so on and so forth. And then the final thing I was gonna mention was um, the multi-use. Um, that was a good point that it does seem like, you know, the central business district, that area is zoned for commercial. And my question to Carolyn is, I mean, when do we have to incorporate multi-use? Okay, um, so your first um, evaluation of creation of subcommittee, that's specifically for evaluating initial projects that don't require public hearing. So subcommittees oh, okay. are really about um, sort of initial reviews of um, projects to determine whether they're exempt. Um, and, and your body as a permitting granting authority with that hat on needs to evaluate the criteria that's in front of you and not sort of distribute a conversation out to the public, but you need to review what's been submitted by the applicant. Um, and that, and in addition, you know, boards reviewing permit applications don't design permits for the applicant. You're actually just evaluating what's been submitted. Um, and then to your, you know, uh, members of the public made um, questions about whether or not um, items had been addressed. Um, maybe they didn't read thoroughly the um, application materials, or maybe there is some missing information, but that's up for the, to, the committee to make the determination. Um, there were there was a detailed description about the costs and the um, total output and costs in the different scenarios. Um, so, you know, it might be a question to make sure you feel comfortable that there was an appropriate gap analysis done. Um, and um, then finally, in terms of the uses, yes, we require. Uh, we can allow residential currently um, in the back portion of the first floor of a building, but the city has, as you know, um, being on the committee, we're working on this form-based code that's going to completely change the structure and the evaluation criteria depending on the different parts of the um, downtown. And this area is going to be considered a side street district in which ground floor residential will be allowed. So um, that's going to be forthcoming. <laughs> hopefully this summer to city council. Carolyn, yeah. that, excuse me, Carolyn. I have yeah. a question. So the current zoning, on, what is the current zoning on the parcel of the church? The current zoning is central business. Meaning it does need commercial on the first floor, correct? For the front portion of a building of the first floor, only the first, um, I think it's 20 feet of depth along the street. Anything back can be residential currently. So the current design that was submitted for the buildings does not provide that, and it's not allowed by the city presently until the zoning is changed, correct? It's not about the design. It's what the first floor, the first 20 feet is used for. So if it's 
has a design that can accommodate flex space, then that's perfectly fine. You're just looking at the design. And then it also goes to the planning board. Um, I mean, the planning board has to go through a whole review process as well. Um, but again, this area is all slated to be restructured to be central business side street, which will allow ground floor residential. Yeah, but oh, that's, all the way to the street. But that's future. Presently, that, that would not be the buildings that were presented would not be accepted, correct? Not necessarily true. The buildings could be approved. It's just the ground, the first 24, 20 feet of depth would have to be commercial. Um, but the rest of the first floor could be residential. Yeah, but yeah, like 140, like live 144. That's that's how uh, that one is done, correct? Right. The rear of that building is residential on the first floor. Yeah, and then, and then 20 feet of depth is is um, commercial. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so how is O'Connell going to address that? I mean, they're planning mm -hmm. those houses or residences now have their a garage and part of the living space mm -hmm. on the first floor. I would be much more amenable to this project if it was commercial space and some people acknowledge that in the public hearing that you know these those buildings uh, as i saw them i believe they were three stories uh it could be a four story building with a first floor commercial space a garage in the back and residences above it it would meet the zoning um and i think that's you know it kind of keeps some of the commercial retail availability in the neighborhood uh, that's uh, yeah uh, and just to to um sort of backtrack on the two, three year period in which the city has been working towards modifying this to have support, residential support, the downtown commercial core is knowing that those um, small commercial spaces at particularly retail and office, that um, market is, is very hard to fill. I mean, Live 155 has, is, taken a really long time as well as the lumber yard to fill up those ground floor commercial spaces because it's not in the core area and we just don't have that same demand that we had 25, 50, 75 years ago for ground floor commercial. So knowing that that's one of the impetuses to the change in the um, central business district is to say not every bit of the central business zoning district can support um, um, ground floor commercial and that what's really important is that energy from 24 seven residential um, uses that sort of are surrounding um, in, in the core area. So um, I think Holly Street's a good example of where um, that's an area that's not gonna be prime market for a ground floor commercial. Could, could I make a suggestion about this? This is really a, a peripheral issue to what we're talking about, the, the first floor commercial. And if, if, if there's a problem because it wouldn't, the design as shown wouldn't be allowed um, under current zoning, we could attach a condition to the um, resolution that we have that would um, get around that somehow. We, I mean, we, we could, we could condition our approval on them altering the design of the new structure to make sure it conforms with zoning. But that's really not the issue that, that's in front of us. Really the issue that's, the important issue that's in front of us is, has the developer um, met the criteria that are, are set in the, um, in the ordinance that we operate under um, so that uh, we should give them the um, permission to go ahead and do the demolition. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, we're, it, you know, as, as uh, we, uh, and all of us are really like historic buildings. We, we really value historic buildings. We want to keep as much historic built property as we can because it's so important to the definition of the town. But at some point we have to recognize the reality of 
what is economically feasible and what's not economically feasible. My fear is that if we deny this permit, we're going to um, uh, uh, enter into a situation where the, where the church just sits there until it deteriorates enough for the building inspector to condemn it. Yeah, but I feel difficult in issuing a demolition permit when the new buildings are not actually designed by code and zoning, not by code, but by zoning. And it, it sounds like this would have to be reviewed through the planning board as well before uh, city permitting would be allowed. Um, I just think an option would be to us to deny the demolition at this meeting and ask O'Connell to come back with their plans at a, at a new application would, would have the, the construction plans that are more detailed and specific to the site, and then we can vote on the whole package. Is that an option, Carolyn? Um, it's an option. If you voted to deny the permit, you'd want to specify what's missing so that they have the opportunity to come back. So if it's just about the detailed um, plans that you would see in a formal application for any new building, that I would also add all requires the planning board review as well, no matter what. I mean, um, any new building downtown requires both boards to review and you, your review is independent of each other's. Um, so if, but if you feel that the rest of the criteria have been met, except that just the one about the detailed design has not been met, make sure that's part of your vote. If you feel like there are other criteria that have not been met, just delineate those reasons why you're voting in either way, if you're voting in favor or um, against the application, um, so that the applicant has, if necessary, the opportunity to come back and address that. I would well, appreciate uh, some feedback from the rest of the committee. Well, I feel that the three, three criteria for demolishing the building, I don't, I feel that one of them has not been adequately met. I sell real estate and I have seen historic buildings that were marketed as building lots because the buildings on sitting on them have been in such disrepair. I have seen buyers come along and restore the buildings that real estate agents have said should be demolished. And this church is in much, much better condition than any of those buildings uh, that really should have been demolished, but because of someone's love of historical structure, they managed to be saved. And so I just think that, um, you know, the pictures that were shown, yes, they show water damage, they, sh they show mortar missing, uh, they show asbestos, there are slates that are missing on the roof, but all of that can be remedied. And, um, you know, all of that has been remedied in other structures. And so I just think that, I think that this falls way short of, uh, of being a building that is unusable or functionally and structurally obsolete. So that will be my, you know, I'm not voting yet, but that's going to be my decision right there because that I think has not been shown to be the case in this building. Whatever they have shown photographs of leakage and wood rot right next to it, you can see that there's mortar that's intact, there's wood that's intact, there's plaster that does not show water damage. And, um, you know, I don't think it's in as bad repair as, uh, as it's been portrayed. And for that reason, um, uh, you know, I, I could not vote to demolish it. Melissa, do you want to weigh in? Um, well, actually, what you said, Joe, is what I was thinking earlier before the meeting that um, that there is a potential that 
we, there will not be a solution and the, the building will fall into disrepair. So I know that it takes a lot of effort and, you know, O'Connell's did do their feasibility study and all, all that, it just takes a lot of work. And then in addition to that, let's say we do all the work ourselves or the public does the work themselves with, with the um, donation that was just provided, then O'Connell still has to be willing to partner with whomever or do a deal with whomever. So that's the, like, that's the biggest hurdle. You know, I, I kind of wish a decision maker was here also um, cause we would know right away O'Connell's viewpoint. I don't mean to say that, that Matt, you're not a decision maker, but I, I'm not quite sure if you would be able to say right now, if, if O'Connell's would be willing, you know, it, it might have to be a certain type of deal or is it something that you can go back and ask? So the public hearing's closed. You can't ask questions of the public okay. or the applicant. So that's all I'm thinking. I'm thinking it's a difficult partnership. Well, I think having those communications. It, I, I think it is. However, the church has been there for, you know, a hundred years. I think it deserves, uh, you know, this extra bit of time, you know. So well, if, we vote, if, if we vote if, to keep, to um, to not demolish it, then uh, O'Connell's will come back with an appeal. I think that's the process. So, or they could come back and and uh, provide the information that you all have voted on as as being um, deemed to be missing. Okay. So so in in whatever motion is is made. Um, some path forward has to be shown to O'Connell so that they can understand what they need to do to um, uh, to go forward. I'm kind of getting the feeling, in, you know, I know that O'Connell did their due diligence in trying to figure out how to redevelop the church. And they, of the three conditions that we have to we must find is one is that reasonable alternatives have been fully considered. I do think O'Connell did their due diligence in developing some options for the church. Uh, unfortunately, the financial markets won't allow that. And I have to agree. I mean, it's a tough market now and it could be a long time before our commercial real estate comes back. You know, as much as Pat's positive about it, I think you know, there's a lot of empty real estate in this town. Um, as far as the second condition, the building is either unusable or functionally and structurally obsolete. It's unusable in its present state due to the very poor conditions of the building, uh, abatement and things like that. Um, I have to give them credit for that. I'm still coming from the place that I would like to see. I'm considering making a motion, and this is not a motion yet, but that we deny the, uh, the demolition application until they come back with a designed set of plans for these buildings, which are nice. That would give the public some time to potentially find a solution. If the public cannot find that solution, we can, we can review the next application with the buildings and pass it and O'Connell can start the development assuming they get through the planning board and the rest of the permitting processes. That's a great point. And I hope they would agree to that. I mean, I know it would be another month or two, but they'll have to develop these plans. Also, I don't see many other alternatives. I don't see, I think the public deserves a chance to come up with an option and offer it to O'Connell. If the public can't do that, they have a right to go ahead with the development. Well, Aileen, what's your reaction to that? Well, I still would like to see that there's disagreement that this building is unusable or functionally or structurally obsolete. 
I, you know, I don't think that it is structurally obsolete. And I think that it can be put to, you know, to different use. So I'm, I'm, I, I understand what Bob is saying. And I do think that uh, their new building proposal does have to be reviewed further with more information. But I don't think that uh, the second condition there should be omitted, uh, should be omitted. So I think that if it's denied, I think what it do you mean the second denied for both. What do you mean the second condition? The second condition that it's unusable or functionally and structurally obsolete. Um, <laughs> so that means you you wouldn't um, sign on to Bob's idea. You you'd want to include some. You'd want to include yeah. something about it, that. Um, you you don't think that they've um, it met the criteria to prove that it's structurally obsolete, right? I mean, it's yeah, so I just want to clarify as well that you need you need three votes in in favor of whatever motion is made, um, and so someone could make the motion and another person could um, amend or request for a friendly amendment or you know whatever. A combination of scenarios you want. So yeah, let's use Bob Bob's um, motion, and then Pauline, you can amend to it. Well, Bob, so do you Bob, want to turn? Your, do you want to? Do you want to turn your proposal into a, a motion? Yeah, I'll, I'll formalize it. So I'll make, I'll, uh, I'll make a proposal that the permit be the permit be denied for the new building until O'Connell presents working drawings and details more thoroughly of the new buildings to be developed on the site. I hope that's worded well enough. Sometimes my English <laughs> lacks. Is that clear, Carol? Yeah, yep. Do I hear a second? I make a motion to second um, okay. Bob's motion. Or you second the motion. You yeah. second that motion. So where does okay. that I second that motion? Where does that leave the other condition that it functions? We'll have to make an amendment if you want to have that in there. Uh, I'd like to make an amendment that it be put in. It has to be worded better than that. <laughs> Yeah, you have to say what your amendment is. What what does your amendment say? I'd like to amend Bob's motion to include that the church is not functionally or structurally. It's not. It's not unusable or structurally obsolete. Could I suggest that you want to say? Um, that they have not proven their case that it's structurally obsolete. Yes, thank you. Carol, Bob, how, do you, feel, Excuse how me. do you feel about that amendment to your motion? And then I Bob, think we need to do an action item associated with it because then they have to know how to respond. I don't, I don't know. I don't think you need to do that. You, I think you just need to make it clear why you're voting against the application. Do you want to read back what you consider the motion, Carolyn, for a clarity? Um, motion on the table to uh, move um, to deny the application uh, because the applicant has not met the criteria for providing a detailed enough um, evaluation. Um, uh, design criteria to evaluate the new building and that the applicant has not proven uh, that the building meets, um, uh, has shown that the building is structurally or, and or functionally obsolete. So Bob, is that amendment agreeable to you for the motion? Um, well, we're in the middle of the discussion here. I... <laughs> It's difficult. I 
think they think they have proved that it's functioning obsolete. Uh, I think we feel it could be improved or repaired, uh, but it's it's between a rock and a hard point. It's two opinions. Uh, there's no proof either way. I, I just, I'm really having a difficult time with this. You know, there's a lot on this here. Um, I, I'm kind of wordless. I, I don't know what to say, frankly. Um, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, you know, I think by their opinion, they, they have proven that the building is, it's not feasible and mostly for economic reasons. It's a big expense to repair that building. You know, uh, it's just, it's a shame, but you know, to meet the current codes, accessibility, you know, abatements, all that stuff is just expensive. Um, I don't know if it's gonna work. I don't think it will work for them financially. And I think the project would die if we don't permit them to do something with that lot. And then the church is just going to deteriorate anyway as it goes, sits around while this decision is trying to be made. Well, I, as a board, I think and one of our obligations is to um, respect economic reality and not ask uh, things of developers that are... Um, unreasonable and beyond their means to to do and we have to we have to respect the the economic reality of the world that we live in yeah but at the same time it will take you know if they were to pursue the historic tax credits it could it could the timing could correspond with the improvement of the uh, economy um they hired a specialist who who, who whose business it is to get historic tax credits for developers, and that and that specialist says he doesn't think that this is a good that, that this that it's going to work in this case. Mm -hmm. Well, we've had architects as well who have spoken, you know, from the public who have said, you know, that they could show them how it could work. Now, uh, <laughs> one is an architect. One is a, one is one is a, the other is a person whose business it is to get the actual historic tax credits and get them get them passed. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I, uh, um, do you want to? I mean, we can. We can. We can we can call a vote on the motion without Pauline's amendment. Well, all I can say is I made the motion that the um, application be denied until we get a more detailed set of architectural drawings to the uh, proposed residences on the property. That's my motion. And Bob, should we also add um, uh, material samples? Because that's part of the application too. Uh, yes, if that's required. That goes without saying, I think. Yeah, okay. I think that's part of the requirement of a present of an architectural presentation. But if you want to add that wording, that's fine. Could you also put in that? Uh, photographs be taken of the interior of the church, exterior and interior, so that it's photographically documented and the photos be um, archived at Forbes Library. So I think with, if that, Pauline, that would be an appropriate if we were, um, that would be an appropriate condition if we were going to approve the demolition. If okay. we're not going to approve the demolition, then I that's yeah. premature, okay. I think. All right. So so are we gonna so we're gonna call the question on Bob's motion without Pauline's amendment, just to reject the um, permit for demolition and request that they come back with um, plans for the new buildings that meet current zoning laws. So if this is approved. And they come back with the new uh, 
you know, their new schematics and drawings. Right. Um, then it, then the demolition will be approved and the new building will be maybe they, you could still you could still vote against demolition when that when they come back with the new with the new drawings you could still vote against demolition it could but on what grounds well, on the same grounds that you just said I could okay all right Shall we call the question? Are we ready to do that? Yeah, I'm ready. Okay, so uh, let's have a uh, let's have a roll call vote. Bob, you want to vote, vote on your motion? I, I vote to support my motion to deny the demolition presently, on conditions that we see the final architectural plans. Melissa, I vote to um, deny the demolition. And Pauline? I vote to deny demolition. And I'm gonna vote against the motion, but with three votes, it passes. Okay. I make a motion to close the public meeting, to, to close the meeting. That's been done already. No. To adjourn. To adjourn the meeting. I told you my English wasn't great. <laughs> I'm a quantitative guy. <laughs> it's been a long Okay, time. you need a roll call for that too. So we're going to, do I have a second to a vote to adjourn the meeting? Yes. Okay. So Bob, how do you vote? I vote yes. Yeah. Melissa? Oh, yes, I, I adjourn voted to adjourn. Pardon me? I vote to adjourn the meeting. Pauline? Yes. yes. In favor. Pauline? Yes, I vote yes. Yes. And I, Joe, also vote.